really a routine. So we came in and, and uh, the guy said, good morning, the head and the head and everything else. And good morning. And this one new guy said, good evening. And the head mom said, hold on, somebody said it wrong. Someone chanted evening. <laughs>
a way for that to happen through animal sacrifice. So the bloodshed of an animal would um, yeah, cover the, the imperfection that was caused by like, being disobedient to what the Lord has said. So for the next thousands of years of human history, God gave all these rules to the Israelites to, so that whenever they messed up, they can be back in a right relationship with God. But this was pretty imperfect. Like, they had to do this a lot. Every time you disobey God, you have to sacrifice an animal. So that's a lot. That's a lot going on. <laughs> so uh, God knew that this was not a perfect plan. So he sent his son to the earth to, to walk on this earth just as you and I are walking. Uh, he was born of a virgin, and he had to learn how to walk and how to talk. Uh, he came in the most humble way that you could possibly come, uh, as God. So he was 100% man in the fact that he um, was tempted in every way to sin, but he was 100% God in the fact that he never sinned. He never fell short. Um, and he performed many miracles when he was on the earth, like causing the blind to see and the dead to rise. So he was he enjoyed a perfect relationship with God because he never broke God's rules. Um, but he still died the death that we all deserve on the cross. So he loves us so much to to go to the cross and to 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 die for to be the perfect animal sacrifice. Um, for all sins, past, present, and future. Um, and three days later, he didn't say that. He rose from the dead in victory over sin and death and proving who he said he was, that he is God. Um, and he says in the very top box that all those who repent, which means to turn from your sin and to want to not disobey God anymore and to believe that Jesus is the one and only way to... to be back in a perfect relationship with God, that those people can enjoy that very thing, a perfect relationship with God again, just as he intended it in the garden. So that's the very top box with our king. Um, and then the question mark at the very bottom is, what's keeping you from following Jesus? So that's how we shared the gospel in India and how I shared it in America. And it's just like a, a simple way of of breaking down all the key points to a, a full gospel share. Um, so, yeah, this is this is the most important thing in the world. Uh, okay, next slide. So, yeah, I'm going to share a little bit about like God's heart for all people to come to know Him, and the fact that the Bible is just one clear story of of. This, of this gospel, God creating all people and their sin and him still wanting all people to come back to a right relationship with him um, and his heart for all nations to come to him. And then we'll move into how that gets accomplished and then I'll talk about it again. Okay, so Genesis 12, 2 is the Abrahamic covenant. And like a lot of people think that the Old Testament was just like power and might of all the Israelites and the New Testament is like, oh, now it's now the gospel, now the Lord is allowing himself to be opened up to, to all people, to the Gentiles. But God's heart is from the very beginning was that Israel would be a, a city on a hill to, to all nations from, from the very beginning. The entire Old Testament is the Lord blessing Abraham and his people to be a blessing to all people. So uh, Genesis 12, 2 said, <coughs> says, And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And he follows, I'm jumping, I'm going to jump around. Back to that in Acts 3, which I know it's not up there, but Acts 3.25 says, brings full circle that promise that Israel is to be a blessing to all nations. Um, when, when Peter is talking to the Pharisees 
And he says, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God has made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So the, the whole plan of the Bible, the whole plan of the Old Testament, is so that Israel can be a blessing to, to all nations and that they would like see and fear God and, and like understand that Israel has something different about them. And the Pharisees, after Jesus ascended, they like didn't get that. So Peter is like imploring them in Acts 3 that they would see that, that this was the plan all along. And back at 2.14, uh, that's the third one there, is for, as the waters cover the sea, so shall the knowledge of the glory of the Lord cover the face of the earth. So it's a, it's a really fun illustration, that same thing. In the Old Testament, the Lord is talking and he is promising that as, as the sea is covered by water, so all of the sea is covered by water, so shall the earth be covered by the knowledge of his glory. Um, and he knows that that's what's best for all people. Like, there's some quote that's like missions. I some great theologian wrote it. I can't remember who. But missions exist because worship does not. Like, worship is is the best thing that we could possibly do as humans. To to be with God in one place. It says that that God inhabits praise. So wherever in the earth worship does not exist, like that's why missions exist. And Malachi 111 is really, really good stuff. It's more, more, kind of more of the same. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place and sense will be offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. So, in a similar vein, like, the, the Lord cares that that we worship Him because He knows that's what's best for us, and He's promising that it will cover the earth. Matthew twenty four fourteen is like the New Testament version of this, and Jesus is talking to His disciples about the end times here, and He says in Matthew twenty four fourteen, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So that's that's another promise that that the end will come, but it it won't come until the gospel is taken to all nations. Right? This is the Lord being patient and wanting all to come to repentance. I'll skip Second Peter three nine for time, and just so that we can really spend some time on Revelation seven nine because it's so awesome. Okay, Revelation seven. 9 through, I'll just read till, till it's good. Uh, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes, and peoples, and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So this is John's revelation about what the throne room is going to look like, and there are people from all tribes and languages and tongues there, and it's, I make me cry, but it's, it's just a beautiful image of, um, yeah, like, that the Lord desires for, for all people to come to him, and, and they will all be there, like all the people from India, and from wherever the gospel is not right now, like they will be in the throne room where we are, and they will be in white robes because of what Jesus has done on the cross with us. So that's just a really a, a sweet promise that the Lord has when when dealing with with stuff like this, with with the with knowing that the world is so lost. Okay, next time. Okay, and God's plan for his knowledge to go to the end of the earth is to use his people. It's, we are, we are the plan. He wants to, to partner with us and, and the gospel going to the very end of the earth so that worship can exist where um, the gospel is not yet present. So Matthew 28, 8 through 
18 through 20, I should have this memorized, but this is the Great Commission, and it's... And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So this is, Jesus has, has resurrected and come back and he's talking to his disciples, and this is the last thing in all of Matthew that he tells them is, go therefore and, like, you're my plan for, for this happening. For people to know what I've just done for them, like, y'all are going to do it. And I'm with you. Like, he is going to go with the disciples wherever they go. Uh, and then this is followed up in Acts 1. So this is, this is the last one. I did a bad job making this PowerPoint. But. but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Uh, so that's the same thing. Jesus is talking to his disciples right before his ascension, and He's like, y'all are going to be the ones to take it to Judea and Samaria, and I'm giving you my spirit. Like, part of the Trinity is, is going with you wherever you're taking this gospel to the ends of the earth. So it's, it's like, he's, he's saying to his disciples, you're my plan, and I will be there right along with you, whole way. Um, and John 15, just read that on your own time. It's so good. It's the, the true vine and where the branches. So we are just like to exist in Jesus and he provides all the means for, for growth and for multiplication and for fruit to be born on us, the branches. Like the vine is what, what supports us. So, uh, and then 2 Corinthians 5 is also you know, a good place to park the, the bus and spend some time. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the, me the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So, as believers, two things are true of you. You are a new creation. You, you have a white robe on because Jesus has, has taken away all your robes that have stains on them. And you are an ambassador of that truth. And, and he, this is his plan all along, that we are, we are ambassadors of Christ. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So, and, and it's so awesome to walk in your identity, your, your full identity of being a new creation and being an ambassador of him. That was his plan all along. I uh, heard this analogy one time that I really loved of, like, God's plan for people to hear his gospel is kind of like a dad raking his leaves. He's like out there getting all the work done and his son comes outside and has his little rake and joins him in the process and kind of messes it up, like makes it a little bit more work for the dad, but the dad is like so overjoyed that his son is out there with him, like also raking the leaves. Like he's He's okay that it's a little bit of a mess because he's just having fun doing his work with his son. Does that make sense? So, like, you know, it's good stuff. Second Corinthians 5 is like, you know, spend lots of time in that chapter. Okay, next slide. Okay, so with, with all of this being said, yeah, God is really concerned with the knowledge of his glory going to the end of the earth, and he wants to use us to make that happen. And the world is really lost, y'all. Like, it needs laborers. It needs co-laborers with Christ. 
Uh, there are 7.75 billion people in the world, and 3 billion are unreached. So that's 40% of the world. And unreached is, these terms are a little vague, but unreached is when a people group has less than 2% professing Christians in it. And that number is, they, all these really smart people have done all this research and made all these terms, and they put it at less than 2% would be qualified as unreached, because that's, that's a good idea of if you're dropped in the middle of that people group, then they don't have much access to the gospel because of that less than 2% number. Nobody's probably going to tell them about Jesus, and there's not much of a cultural significance to them. So you wouldn't really know to, to Google into your phone like a gospel account or something like that. And in lots of these places, there are um, the gospel, I mean, the Bible is not translated into their language, and a lot of people don't have access to the internet in the world, and there's a lot of illiteracy left in the world, even in our country. So that's why the number is at less than 2%. And that's true of where we were. Like, we would go to people all the time and be like, in India, and be like, have y'all heard you about Jesus? And they're like, who is that? Like, is that your friend? <laughs> they have no concept for, for who Jesus is. And uh, some people, even if they did know about Jesus, they couldn't give no details about his life. So we would follow up. If, if they said, yeah, we, we know about Jesus, we'd be like, well, can you, can you tell me about his life? And they're like, ooh, Mary? And I'm like, ooh, that is not good enough for salvation. <laughs> like, we got to have more details than that. So that kind of gives you an idea about what unreached means. And it's 40% of the world, so that's a major problem. And a people group is, we, we can't really understand this because we're in such a melting pot, which is a great thing, but the rest of the world is not a melting pot. It's pretty tribal, and a, a people group is classified as something where, we sh where they, a people group shares enough language and culture for ease of understanding. And this is for the purpose of gospel, of a gospel movement. That if I share with someone in a people group, then that person can easily enough be understood by all of the people in their group because they share in language and culture. So that's what a people group means. So there's like 7,000 people groups in the world, I think, and there's way more countries than that. So that's kind of hard to, to understand as Americans, but it's because there's just so many different like, castes of people and little bitty languages that really poor people speak in third world countries and they can't be understood by people a town over who speak a completely different language. So, and the last statistic up here is 3.5% of the world is unreached, unengaged, which means that we don't know of a single Christian missionary who is trying to, to share the gospel with anybody for 300 million people in the world. That's uh, like less than the size of our country, but not by much. So that's a, that's a really sad statistic. Okay, next slide. And most of the lostness in the world is comprised in the 1040 window. So that is like, I don't know, 10 degrees of latitude by 40, and that's the box that they made. I don't know exactly, I'm not a good geographist, but it's two thirds of the world's population is in this box, and 97% of unreached people groups are housed here. So this is the center of lostness in the world, and there's a lot of people, and only 3.3% of modern missionaries are sent here. So that's, that is a problem. Like, why? I mean, I guess why is because those places are not fun to go to. <laughs> the North Africa, desert, Middle East, desert, very hostile to Christians, 
and the, uh, like, you know, it's not places you'd go on vacation, and uh, I think that's why people don't really want to go there. But, uh, but people need to, to go here. There are very few Christians and a lot of people who don't know Jesus' name that need to hear it. So with that being said, uh, and having learned all of that, like in my time in college and being discipled and all of this stuff, um, and like, yeah, who Jesus is in his heart, I went with four of my friends to India. And uh, we went last summer, and I had to raise funds, and this, this church supported me, so thank you for your support. And uh, we had an interesting time. And uh, anyway, it's, it's a, a massive country. There's a, a lot of lostness, a lot, very few people who knew Jesus. And I won't tell you exactly where we went in the country for security reasons, but uh, next year. But a religious conversion is illegal in the place that we went to. Um, which, you know, sounds really scary, but, but really they just don't want people, like, forcefully converting people to another religion. But what we did is kind of go up to people on the street and be like, tell me about that temple over there. And they would, and we'd be like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Can we tell you about what we believe? And that's not illegal. Um, so we were like, we weren't like really in harm's way of the law, even though, you know, it's, it's kind of sketchy. So, but it is like missionaries are not allowed. Like a missionary visa is not a thing. So we were like on a tourist visa and, you know, that kind of deal. So we actually went to a place where we knew a missionary family. One of the guys who was on our team, he met this missionary at a conference in Montgomery, and he has been there for eight years, this missionary guy. And he has four kids, and they have a team of a few other couples. So we were joining this missionary team that's been doing ministry and life there for eight years. So we had a contact and didn't live with them, but we did a lot. They taught us how to do ministry and stuff. Okay, and so in the city that we were in, there's about 8 million people, which for them is not very big, because every city in, in India is just categorically huge. So we were in like the Birmingham of India, like a small little city, and uh, very few Christians, less than 1%, and lots of Hinduism, lots of Islam. And, and Hinduism is really like a terrible thing. Like Hinduism and Islam are both just very man-made, like very obviously man-made, and they really oppress the poor. Like their their religion says that do all the good that you can do for God and try and earn your standing with Him, and maybe He'll give you good things. And there's a lot of poverty in these areas, and that is not the gospel. Like, our religion says that one sin disqualified us from knowing God, but the blood of Jesus was enough, was more than enough, to save us from that so that we can be in right relationship with Him. So, they, like, they need to be told that, because their religion is oppressing them. Like, we saw all these really poor Hindu people just like giving the, the little money that they had to the feet of these idols and it was just it's just awful. Like it's so sad to watch. So anyway, if you know some some really nice Hindu people or some like really nice Muslims, like that is so great. And like hear what they what they have to say, but like tell them that there's something better, like, you know, with wisdom. Next. So, with that being said, we had two jobs in India, and that was to share the gospel with as many people as we could, and we would do this, like, during the daytime, we would go, like, the five of us from Auburn, and we'd go to, like, a really ritzy area of town where a lot of people spoke English, and we would just share in English, and that was really easy and awesome, and then, is to share the gospel. 
Like, we need people to share in America, in the South, as much as we do in India. Um, so, like, I challenge you to try and share the gospel with one person this week. And um, go back to the second slide. So, yeah, just like maybe practice this with someone in your home this week and go through each of the boxes and feel comfortable about it. And um, when you see someone at work or at the gym this week, you can be like, this is what we learned in Sunday school and about how like God really cares for, for all people. And um, anyway, welcome to the gospel. And then go back to the very last slide. So, if you want more resources about the nations, the Joshua Project is a great place to start. It has, it's the joshuaproject.net, and it has all this crazy data about unreached people groups, and the map is really cool to look at, and look at the 1040 window, and all its, you can research like every single people group and their statistics, and it has like ways that you can pray for all of the people groups. And Radical by David Platt is a really good book, and Radical.net has tons of resources. And my number is up top if you want to reach out to me. I love to get coffee with people and talk. So, do that. And praying at 1002 for laborers is a great way to, to get your heart into to caring about the things that God cares about. So, uh, Luke 102 is the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, plead earnestly for the Lord to send laborers into his harvest field. So, with that, let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for who you are and for all you've done, Lord. We just plead before you that you would send laborers um, overseas to places where the gospel really needs to go. Father, I pray that you would send people from this room to the nations, um, send people from this room to their workplaces this week uh, with, with eyes for the lost and with mouths for the gospel. So yeah, we just pray that this would happen. I pray for all the people in India that we got to share with, that you would grow the seeds that are sown, Lord, and yeah, we just really in awe of you and how beautiful you are, God. Christ's name, amen. amen.